Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm so happy to be here. Four o'clock rock on a Wednesday, and you know what that means. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Jay Fidel. My co-host is Mike Hamnett. He's a co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is the, the progenitor of this whole episode and show and series and everything. Hi, Mike. Hey, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> we have two special guests from HNEI, followed by a third guest later in the show. And uh, to my left is uh, Tatiana, wait, Reshintenko. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and to her left is Jean Saint Pierre, with a, with a hyphen. That's correct. <laughs> Hello, Jay. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you guys here. We've had a great month talking about HNEI. We found out so much stuff. All this great research that's going on right under our noses on Cook Street, believe it or not. So we are delighted to have you here. We want to know more. And tonight's show is about fuel cells. We're going to dig deep on fuel cells. Do you want to put this in perspective, Mike? Well, it is the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, HNEI. <laughs> Thank you. For the acronym folks. Yeah. And uh, now this is a, it's a long standing research unit at the University of Hawaii, and they've been working on hydrogen for quite some time now and a bunch of other things. So it's, um, and it's funded partly by the state, partly by the, uh, um, the fuel tax. And, uh, but some really good work going on there. Yeah, fabulous. Okay, so what are we going to talk about tonight? Let's, let's get your share, uh, Tatiana, and then we'll get Jean's share. So, uh, summary now, what are you going to talk about tonight? Well, I would like to tell several words about how fuel cell cells work, and then introduce which kind of fuel cell products are available in the market, and which kind of challenges uh, fuel cell technology is facing right now, and why it's still in the early stage of commercialization. Okay. And you guys are doing some interesting research down there. You're going to talk about that, John? Yes, that's correct. Yes, I will talk a little bit about uh, our uh, own facility here in Hawaii, uh, world class, I would say. And uh, then after that, I will detail a little bit more the, the, the research project uh, that we have. And then that will link to what our third guest uh, will talk about later. Okay, got patents? Plenty. <laughs> then you can talk about it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there are no secrets here at ThinkTech. <laughs> well, Tatiana, let's start with you. So give us the landscape, you know, how does this work now with fuel cells in the marketplace and in the continuum toward 100% clean energy? Okay, fuel cells is a system which can directly convert chemical energy or fuels to the electricity without involving in any movement, parts, or combustion. So because of that, it's very efficient compared to the regular Carnot cycle. So if you look on my first slide, you can see the principal schematics of the fuel cell operation. Let's see the first slide then. Okay. So you can see that there are anode and the cathode of the fuel cell, and there is electrolyte, which divides two electrodes. Uh, fuel is supplied on the anode, and there is oxidation of the fuel with formation of the ion and electrons. Um, ions will move through electrolyte, while uh, electrons will go through wires from the anode to the cathode, and this is electrical current, and we can use it to power our, our uh, devices. At the cathode, there is a reaction between oxygen, electrons, and the ions, the formation of the products of reaction, which is water. Um, usually, you can see that fuel cell can operate as long as the fuel and oxidant are supplied. And this is the main difference between fuel cell and the batteries, because there is no charging step here. Usually one cell produces a voltage lower than one volt, and that's why we need to put several cells and make a stack, as you can see on the um, next figure here, and to get our desired voltage to power our devices, electrical devices. So, um, if you look on there, so fuel cell provides uh, different it's a source of electricity. And um, which kind of application for fuel cells? Fuel cells has application as a stationary power sources, uh, portable power sources, and to power vehicles. Um, if you look on the power port, uh, stationary power sources, which we can do, we can produce actually electricity and we can produce a hot water which is actually were implemented for in any farm, Japanese any farm program. Mm -hmm. Then we use a natural gas to get, a, to, get a, to get a hydrogen, and then use hydrogen to get a oh. electricity and hot water to so, supply. Uh, natural gas is the yeah. source of hydrogen yes. for the fuel cell. Yes. 
And uh, actually, this program started in 2009, and Japanese uh, manufacturers and uh, manufacturers, they distributed around 150,000 units through their how many? Eight years. And it was quite successful program. And also, uh, for, for st stationary power sources, I would like to mention that there is a uh, new product from Toshiba on the market. It's, a, it's called H21. It's a unit which can utilize renewable sources of energy, and you can produce a hydrogen from them through electrolysis, store hydrogen. It's an electrolyzer. Yeah. You can keep hydrogen there and then use this hydrogen to produce electricity. It's a... It's uh, the power which can supply the system is around up to 100 kilowatts. It can be used. Expensive? And it's probably expensive, but currently Toshiba distributed it for uh, field uh, investigations to for field tests. And it's uh, right now in several cities, in several uh, port areas. So what do, you, what do you think the future is? And where is this all going to go? We know cars. Yes. Um, but, but there are challenges, and I'll ask you about that. Um, what else beside cars and other vehicles? Well, as I said, there are stationary power sources, and um, and also there are portable power sources. So small uh, devices which can replace batteries or to 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 uh, to power some devices. Whatever. Uh, it could whatever. Be anything. Yes. It could be it's, anything. It's, it, it can be anything. Yes. So okay. So uh, what are the challenges now? Well, there are several challenges here. First of all, of course, if you are talking about hydrogen fuel cells. Um, there is a hydrogen infrastructure. It's a challenge here, and the next challenge it's a it's a cost of this material of this system because they are using platinum and platinum is expensive, and there is a target to reduce cost of these units. Uh, what about suppose all the women give up their uh, wedding rings? <laughs> oh, it's a, uh, it's, 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 it's gold. It's a gold, so oh, gold sorry, does not okay. work <laughs> here. So <laughs> we have to stick to the platinum, which is a little bit just trying to be creative. <laughs> yeah, here, yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> part, part of the goal is to find other. Um, subs uh, other Substance. materials besides yes. platinum yes. That, that would be cheaper. Yes, that's correct. And uh, there is an iron containing catalyst, which right. might be a good substitute for that. Uh, the third challenge here is the durability, durability of the system and environmental adaptability. So the system should operate in different operating conditions at low temperature, high temperature, which kind of air quality or fuel quality. Right. They have to be sustainable in that conditions. And and the last but not the least, it's of course it's workforce development. Right. So if we have this system in the market, we need to have maintain to maintain, maintain, to, to yeah. maintain them to, to to provide service. And of course, it's a it's a way the educator should should move. Mm -hmm. Of course, these challenges they are they are challenges. They shows they show us a direction where research and science should go in the future to make this technology viable and available in the market. And actually, in the Hawaii, here we have a facility which is working in that area for almost 15 years. And it's a, it's a world class facility. And I think Jean will tell several words about what we are doing in detail. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Jean, tell us what's going on in terms of the research. Uh, well, before going there, I think I, I wanted to say a few words about the facility itself. And I think uh, oh, I have a slide to, to that effect there. So this is a, you know, a sub portion, I guess, of the uh, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So we have a fuel cell testing lab, which is, uh, we renamed it um, the Hawaii Sustainable Energy Research Facility. Not this slide, I think, not the next one, but the following one, if possible. Yeah, let's skip this one. And here we go. So it's the Hawaii Sustainable Energy Research Facility, or for short, HiSurf. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't come up with the name. Uh, I think uh, our director actually came up with that. He would, um, he's a surfer. <laughs> here we go. So uh, you, you, yeah, you got it. Uh, so I, th I think it's a fairly catchy name here for Hawaii. So uh, we're located on uh, Cook Street. Uh, it's on Hawaiian property. It started back in 2002 uh, after a Public Utilities Commission decision in order, uh, if I remember, serve me right, it's 19398 uh, to create uh, you know, this facility here. So you can see our logo on top on the, on the, on the left there. And you can see that the logo are actually on the, uh, the warehouse itself. Uh, 
So if you look inside, uh, obviously I'm just showing here on the right, only one of the test stations that we use to obviously characterize fuel cells and investigate and try to understand them and that sort of thing. Uh, what is not clear here is where is the fuel cell? So if you look at the computer screen there, to the lower left a little bit there, you can see a black square essentially there. That's your fuel cell where all the wires actually converge themselves. So we have a number of different units like that that we can test fuel cell. And uh, if we compare ourselves to other labs in the world, we, uh, we do go good research mm -hmm. and we're definitely well equipped to actually characterize fuel cells. So definitely world class here. And it's right here in Hawaii. So what are you testing them for? Ah, so uh, why are we testing them? OK, so more, during the last few years, maybe three, four years, there's essentially three major themes we've been exploring uh, at the facility. The first one is somewhat obvious because most of our funding comes from the Office of Naval Research. So as part of this deal, essentially, we're supporting a lot of their activity at their Naval Research Laboratory in Maryland. So we have a collaboration there, and we have them on different topics. Uh, obviously, I cannot necessarily talk about all the topics uh, there, but it, clearly it has to do with about you know, um, uh, unmanned air, uh, unmanned, sorry, uh, aerial vehicles and unmanned underwater vehicles, because we're talking about the Navy here. So we're supporting a lot of the activities there. Um, the second topic here, and uh, I'll skip, I'll keep it short, because I'm going to come back later to it, is contamination. So Tanya was talking about that, you know, air, and especially oxygen in air, has to be supplied to the cell, and hydrogen as well. But depending how these things, hydrogen is produced, normally contain substances that you don't necessarily want in the fuel cells. Same with air. You know, you're familiar with, ah, today we have, um, you know, I have fewer air, but, you know, but if, if you're I get, in an underwater vehicle, you need to have a source of air. No? Let's come back to that question. So the, the point is, there's substances uh, that actually, most substantial will actually sit on the platinum catalyst that Tanya was talking about and blocks the reaction, okay? So we don't want that. Uh, one key culprit here in Hawaii is sulfur dioxide, which mm. is pewed by, obviously, the volcano. And then we'll come back to that later because Mitch is going to give a little bit more detail about the program with respect to that. So bottom line here is many substances actually are not very good for fuel cell operation. So that, that's been uh, essentially uh, the second topic here. A third topic is also, because we understand fuel cell, we had a good experience, we continually also try to develop new methods to actually characterize those fuel cells and to understand them. So to this day, there's still a need for doing that. So that's basically these three topics cover pretty much what we've been doing in the last few so years. And what are you seeking in the end? I mean, what is this all this directed at? Uh, greater efficiency, greater productivity, what? Well, or with cheaper. respect to, well, cheaper is part of it, but I, I actually, since we're not at the moment doing material research, the cost is not necessarily something we directly look at. However, contamination is, I will link it to durability, okay? Because normally if you have a contaminant that affects your fuel cell, it would take these contaminants in air or hydrogen usually are in part per million, okay? and it take it take quite some time to actually create the effect. So that may develop over tens or hundreds of hours. So we're talking about durability of the system at this time. Okay. So the objective here is that, okay, can I prevent the contamination in the first place? Okay, so we were involved in the past to actually, um, Sorry, I'm um, losing my words here for a second. So uh, hydrogen has specification in terms of purity. So we were involved in actually defining those specifications. So that's one, one thing we, we, we've been working on. Also, in the lab, now that we contaminants, we recognize how important this is, we also, you know, you have that in the, in the internal combustion engine. You have a filter, okay? So in a fuel cell, you also have an air filter to try to 
capture all it these things. Yeah, this right? is the preventive part of, mm -hmm. uh, of the research mm -hmm. there. So we have capabilities to actually test new filters, and we also have activities to uh, design new filter materials. Okay. So we have somebody actually. So material doing science is, is an essential part of this. Oh, and it, well, give me a second here. And actually, you're totally right. I, I think in the future, we will do more and more of that. And I think Tanya already mentioned with respect to you know, different catalysts, but it's more than just the catalyst. There's also other aspects to look at. Um, so, um, in turn, and also, let's say that the, the filter fails or somebody decide not to replace their filter on time, uh, the, the fuel cell yeah, can get contaminated. So in that moment, we're trying to answer the questions, what can we do about it? Can I recover the performance I lost? Okay. So many contaminants, fortunately, if you remove the source of the contaminants, they will just recover by themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's still a number of contaminants that, and sulfur dioxide is one of those, if you get it gets in the cell, you have to actively do something to remove it. And mm -hmm. that takes some doing. And there's mm -hmm. still research being doing there because it's difficult to do in the actual application. Okay. If you're using natural gas as a source, there's sulfur in natural gas. Yes, that's what's coming back to uh, how the hydrogen is made. So predominantly these days is methane reforming. And obviously sulfur is a, is a key component of this. But if it's water electrolysis, then usually it's different type of contaminants that get there, if any at all. Because I think, I think it's pure, uh, you know, we will get the pure, pure hydrogen, hydrogen there. Yeah. Correct. That's right. So was there anybody else doing so, this research elsewhere? Are you way ahead of the crowd or what? <laughs> I, I think, are you collaborating? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, Tanya, is, for example, is collaborating uh, on ca uh, Catalyst with the University of, New, New, sorry, University of New Mexico. In terms of contamination, we're definitely ahead of the game here, I think. I think we, if, if you look at what's been done here in Hawaii, there's not many people in the world actually look at these problems. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that people yeah, so. don't know. You have to know that we're way ahead. I mean, yeah. that Hawaii has yes. some world-class research going on in fuel cells. Thank you, uh, Jay. I appreciate that. That's, well, that's what I think, <laughs> anyway. And I think you guys are really a good example so, of that right um, here, uh, you know, a quarter mile okay. from where we sit. But so, uh, let's, let's uh, we, we have to close on this part of the discussion. Yeah. Tatiana, we missed a couple of your slides. I wonder if you could sort of wrap around this <laughs> and um, tell us, you know, what this research is going to mean in terms of the marketplace uh, and what it's going to mean in terms of um, Hawaii's position in being a leader on fuel cells. Well, actually, I would like to tell you that every year, uh, 60 to 70,000 fuel cell units are manufactured and shipped globally. And, of course, uh, Asian region, Asia, like Japan and South Korea, they are the leaders, the leaders for fuel cell deployments. So I think it's, for Hawaii, it's very interesting to be here because we are in the, in the middle between uh, Asian region and, yeah. Amer and America. And they probably could be a sort of... Um, place for adoption of this new technology and taking advantage from the Asian, Asia and from America. So all these technology can meet here. And I think because we have here a world class facility, I think we have a good opportunity to to bring that together. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may just add an element to that, uh, totally different than what Tanya is saying here, uh, which is totally valid, is that we have to realize that even though many of these systems are commercially available now, there's still a lot of need for continuing research. Sure. And the reason for this is that somebody has to adopt or say, I'm going to buy this product. Now you're going back to social science. <laughs> and at, Technology adoption usually follow a S-shaped curve, okay? So it's slow at first, accelerate, and then saturate when the market, obviously, uh, has absorbed, uh, you know, the technology. It's just like, obviously, the cell phone here. So, but um, where we are today, usually adoption is self-sustaining when you're about five, between 5 and 20% adoption. So even though these things are commercially available now, we orders of magnitude below that at the present time. So that means that there's still a lot we can do to accelerate this. Okay. If you're operating on the so, assumption that this technology, fuel, sector te uh, fuel cell technology, 
will be an answer to many questions out there uh, in energy, in consumer products. I remember it was a computer, it was a Japanese company, I think, that was going to build fuel cells into their computers in order to generate the electrical current necessary to run the computer. I don't know if that ever happened. No, it's... Uh, it's happening now? There were some prototypes and there were products on the market for direct maintenance of fuel cells we yeah. were developed for to power um, computers like a Toshiba Samsung. Toshiba is one thing. Toshiba yeah. Samsung developed that. Uh, that. But, uh, but as I said, it was the main challenge here because this system is a little bit expensive compared to regular batteries. That's why probably it stopped. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges here has been to, to find renewable energy for transportation. I mean, we've been true. hopelessly behind in that, uh, yeah. that whole sector, and fuel cells is a... Fuel cells it's are promising. Right light. Yeah. It is promising, um, and the results are there. Um, Tanya mentioned that. There's already commercial systems available out there. They're being adopted. There's more and more of it. So that's a positive spin I will give. I've been in fuel cells since '95. Uh, the next uh, <laughs> uh, guess, uh, even longer than I am. Um, and um, over all this entire period, I see more and more and more in the field. So something is happening. Something good Something's is happening. Something's happening, and you but guys are on the point of it. We're not yet at the so self-sustaining adoption ratio well, yet. We so. have to keep in touch with you, actually, yeah. Jean. OK. Yeah. Jean St. Pierre, with a hyphen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tatiana Rezinchenko. Thank you for coming down, you guys. We're going to go to the second part of our show right after this break. All right, Mike? Yep. Okay, Time I'm going to go right back. <laughs> You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Bingo, we're back. Mike Hammond and I are enjoying an education in hydrogen fuel cells. Wow. We are indeed. We are indeed. We have one of our And now we've got the program manager for here. hydrogen right. fuel cells at HNEI. That's was in Hawaii Natural, Natural Energy, Energy Institute. Institute. Yeah. Got it, guys. And yeah. his name is Mitch Ewan, and we know him for about 600 years. Yeah. <laughs> right. As a member of the forum, actually. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So <clears throat> where do you come in on this as the program manager for hydrogen? Yeah, I'm the Hydrogen Systems Program Manager. What I do is I take uh, technology that's almost commercially ready and I deploy it in the real world. So I take the work they've done and I'm deploying it right now. For example, during this show, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing on the Big Island, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where I'm deploying uh, three, where three hydrogen fuel cell buses will be deployed on the Big Island. So if you want to throw up that first slide, I just want to give you an overview of the project, <coughs> which shows... Um, once it comes up. Yeah, let's look at that slide. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So picture the Big Island. So we have a project on the Big Island where we are producing hydrogen in Kona, right beside the Kona Airport. You'll see that on the left of the slide. Um, so I have a hydrogen production system there that's comprised of an electrolyzer. I'll have hydrogen storage. And we'll also have a hydrogen dispenser so we can fuel one, one of our buses there, which will be operated by the Helion Bus Service. The, the uh, it's a commercial bus service. Yeah, it's no, the county it's bus. The county bus. Yeah. County bus. And right, we right, purchased right. that bus using uh, barrel tax money. And then you converted it. 
and U.S. Hybrid, who is active here in Hawaii, converted that over to a fuel at cell. At HCAT. At HCAT. Yeah. Right, right down the street. Just down the street from yeah, our fuel yeah, and cook yeah. street. Yeah, All exactly. good things happen in Kaka'ako, I can right. say. They do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just looking at the slide, so we're, we're producing the hydrogen in, in Kona. We have two additional buses that are going to be deployed at uh, Volcano National Park. You can see that to the right of the picture. And in order to get the hydrogen from uh, Kona, to uh, Havo, we use uh, hydrogen tube trailers or hydrogen transport trailers. You'll see those are the white things. I have some pictures, some photographs of them mm -hmm. later uh, in, in, the, in the show here. Mm -hmm. And it's about 138 miles, and we you know, haul them by a truck, and we're working with Aloha Petroleum and one of their subcontractors to actually haul the hydrogen from Kona to uh, Havo. So in this electrolyzer, uh, what are you putting in? What are you getting out? Yeah, we're putting in electricity, which we get from the grid and water. Um, the grid actually on the Big Island during the day, a bright sunny day, is about 83% renewable energy. And then that falls at night to about 50%. So, so you get it during the day. We get the maximum amount of renewable energy during the day, but we still have to operate this 24-7 to get mm -hmm. the amount of hydrogen we need to operate so these it's buses. So it's a storage device. The hydrogen is acting as a storage device. Exactly. It stores energy. It's okay. A great storage. Why, why would I want a hydrogen bus instead of a regular old-fashioned bus? Well, I know that's a really open-ended question. Yeah, there's but lots of reasons, but it. the two primary <laughs> ones is people, pe there's like, in, like on the mainland, people will wait for the hydrogen bus before they take the diesel bus. First of all, the diesel bus is very noisy, and also it spews out hydrogen, uh, I mean, uh, um, carbon. Uh, yeah, carbon, uh, exhaust. So yeah, it's yeah. smelly, dirty, whatever. People will wait for the quiet, stealth ride of the hydrogen bus every time. Yeah, Stan Osterman took us on a trip in a hydrogen bus at Hickam one time. You couldn't hear anything. Yeah. yeah. The loudest sound was the, you know, was... The rattling the, the, of the bus. The rattling <laughs> of the bus, right. <laughs> uh, with the keys in your pocket or something. Was, right. There was no sound from the generation system. Yeah, it's got uh, very good power, very good acceleration, uh, because it has lots of torque, because it's propelled by electric motors. So it, uh, the drivers love it, and the mechanics like it because they don't have to deal with a dirty, old, greasy engine when they're maintaining. There's hard, not that much maintenance to do on it. And we're also re able to recapture a lot of the energy from braking because the bus is always braking every time it stops. So we regenerate that uh, power yeah, in storing the, the battery. battery on board the bus. So it yeah. becomes very mm -hmm. efficient. So it's about twice as efficient as a diesel bus. That's great. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, all those environmental considerations Correct. Are, yeah, are involved. Exactly. But um, what, do you, what do you hope to achieve with this project? I mean, what are you going to show the world? Where, where does it go after you? What, what conclusions do you want to make and what, what do you want to ha happen after that? Okay, so um, the strategy is to focus on public transportation because we are using taxpayers' dollars right now to put these systems in place. So the general public deserves to have an opportunity to use this. It also provides the uh, general public with the experience of using these things, and so it's an educational uh, tool to develop the awareness of just how good these things really are so that uh, they will uh, embrace it and want to use it. So that building confidence. Building confidence in the product, because right now it's just uh, nobody knows what it really is. They haven't had the experience you've had of riding on the bus and saying, wow, this is really quiet, this is great, you know, I love this, you know. <laughs> So that's what it does. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of anticipation for us to develop this and deploy these on the Big Island. Um, by deploying the two buses at Volcano Park, they get over almost 2 million visitors a year at uh, Hawaii Volcano National Park. So this is a great way to provide outreach, not just for Hawaii, but also uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. See, and you've got educational materials that go along with the... Correct. Yeah, we'll have a very active outreach program once yeah. it starts. Now, you, you were here while we had a, the first part of the show. You heard uh, John St-Pierre St. and right. uh, Tatiana Rezinchenko talk about their research right. at HNEI. I'm sure it's, you know them. They must be in the same building. Right uh, no, year. no, no. I, I had the uh, honor of actually designing that building. Uh, oh, okay. That was my first oh, project. Oh, the university. Yeah, but I, well, I office up at the, up okay, at the main so, university. But yeah. you know, they're in the same organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we so, know each other. And you know their research, of course. Sure. So how is their research going to affect your project? Uh, what do you hope to build into this whole bus system yeah. with that new technology? The new technology they are developing or enabling, 
um, to, to make this happen. Yeah, well, there, one of the main focuses was on the effect of contaminants on fuel cells. So what we did is we designed a new air filtration system for the buses that will be operating at Volcano Park because they have a very high level of uh, sulfur dioxide at the park. So it's like kind of an accelerated program. Kind of the air like you'd find in Beijing, you know, China. So what we developed is what I characterize as a smart uh, air filtration system. So what we do is we measure the level of contaminants coming into the air system before it enters the fuel cell. Then it goes through the uh, filter. Then we have another set of sensors that measures the contaminants as it comes out of the filter before it enters your fuel cell. And if it reaches a certain maximum where it shows that your filter isn't hacking the job, it cuts it off. And, and shuts down the fuel cell. Until so that you the, change the filter. Until we change the filter, or as part of what we've developed is it can swap over to a, a brand new filter so that mm -hmm. the bus can continue on going through this <clears throat> plume of uh, high sulfur dioxide without killing well, the fuel well, cell. What I hear you saying, it's really bad to have the contaminants in there, and it might damage the membrane in the fuel cell. Is that what it happens? Yeah, it damage? damages the catalyst. Essentially, it kills your fuel cell. That's the bottom line, the, the, and the degradation is very severe. So you don't want that. That's a that's a thing you do not want to that's happen. That's an expense all in itself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, we've actually submitted a patent for this. So uh, it's still in process, but we 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 submitted a full level uh, patent. So so you know, actually Tatiana made some comment about that, and I didn't realize how important it was. It takes air to run a fuel cell. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and you've got to have good air. It can't be, you know, air with contaminants. Exactly. And a lot of air has contaminants, so you have to you have to do this. Exactly. This is going to be an enabler for technology around fuel cells Absolutely. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and Kilauea is a great place to test. It sure yeah. is. It's it's a really yeah. accelerated yeah. testing. Yeah. And, yeah. and we're working with a great partner with the U.S. Hybrid, who is actually now uh, doing business in China. So we have a, we have a way to uh, promote our technology and get it out in the marketplace and, uh, you know, leverage UH uh, technology and hopefully make money for the university, which is a good thing to do. Now, what about the membranes themselves? You're working on that, too? You're working on the essential nature of the fuel cell, the structure of the fuel cell? I, I don't personally work on that. He deploys. Uh, I deploy it and test it. No, I say you, I mean H N E I. Yeah, yeah we've been, we, we don't actually work on the membrane itself as developing new types of membranes. I mean... There's a whole industry out there that does that, but we look at what the effects are of the hydrogen contaminants and air contaminants on the performance of, the, of those membranes. Is this kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, an experiment, I guess, this, project, this kind of project being yeah. done elsewhere uh, in the U.S.? Uh, are there other, you know, fuel cell buses running? Are there other people studying yes. them the way you are? Probably not quite the way. We, we have a little bit of uniqueness. I mean, you have to be unique to be able to go out and win, win project money. But yes, there, you know, for example, AC Transit in uh, California has 12 full-size 40-foot buses they've been operating for the last 10 years. And they've got Sunline Transit in uh, Palm Springs uh, operating, I think, five or six uh, fuel cell buses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you have them all instrumented up and you take data and you analyze uh, how long uh, the system will last. So. Um, a little commercial for UH, uh, for US Hybrid, they have one stack that's lasted over 25,000 hours and it's still going. That's impressive. That's impressive, yeah. yeah. So I mean, there must come a time, or maybe, maybe it's a vision at this point, that every commercial vehicle, you know, whether it's government or private, uh, whether it's a truck or a bus, uh, any, any big commercial vehicle can and should run on hydrogen and fuel cells. I mean, Absolutely. What, what's the path between here and there? Uh, the pathway is actually to do what we're doing, is get the, demo, get the demonstrations on the road to show industry that these things work and that they're not going to fail and they have the longevity. They last 25,000 hours. That is something. You know, that's what you have to do, to build the confidence because the guy running the business does, does not, not want does not to So <laughs> I rode over here in a cab, and the cab driver is saying, yeah, those electric vehicles are great, but one of them just stopped dead in front of me in traffic. And and you know stall that everybody out. Thing that's what you don't want. You, people you don't want to have that happen. Yeah, so that's yeah, why yeah. we do these experiments and, and and get lots of hours on the vehicle so that people have the confidence to make that investment. So for example, I'm working with the uh, the bus, uh, the County of Hawaii bus uh, uh, agency, and what they want to see out of the bus that we're deploying with them is just that: is how long will it last? You know, or will the uh, passengers want to use it? All these kinds How of things. How cost effective is How cost it? effective, cost effective yeah, yeah, exactly. Because maintenance and repair is an element of cost. But right. taking that out for a minute, just in terms of running the bus down the road, 
Is it cheaper? Can it be cheaper? W will it soon be cheaper to run a hydrogen fuel cell yeah. bus down the road than a gas bus? Uh, the, like I said, the, the bus itself is twice as efficient as a diesel bus. The, the issue is the cost of the hydrogen. And the cost of the hydrogen, if you're making it from electrolysis of water, is the cost of the electricity that goes into it. So for example, if we were using our geothermal resource we have here in Hawaii, we can get pretty inexpensive electricity to do that. That would make it totally viable. If I'm taking electricity off the grid at 26 a kilowatt, cents a kilowatt hour, that's not going to work. We mm. need cheap electricity, uh, uh, electrical near input. Near zero cost electricity is what's yeah, make Well, zero work. would be yeah. awesome, but yeah. Yeah, there's no such well, thing as that. What about solar panels on a roof somewhere? I thought, I thought you were going to... I, I thought you were yeah, going to say that when I, you began was, uh, Well, I was at a meeting this morning where, you know, uh, uh, just before I came over here, and they were talking about uh, on the mainland for very large uh, grid-scale uh, PV uh, installations about 2.75 cents a kilowatt hour. That would that's totally... Getting close. That, well, that, now, that, now that's getting close. No, that's talking. there. We're there with that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's what we have to get down to here. You know, okay. We so. need to be about 5 or 6 cents a kilowatt hour for it to be viable. Exciting. Exciting yeah, possibility. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's not necessarily... Uh, it's more than just economics. I mean, you know, for example, um, we didn't go to light bulbs because light bulbs were cheaper. I mean, actually... Uh, whale oil and all that kind of stuff was a cheaper way to get illumination, but it was the better technology because you didn't have soot, you didn't have all these other benefits. All these other right? benefits. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you have like a little double A battery, the electricity in there is worth about one hundred and twenty-five dollars a kilowatt hour. But we it, it's we use it because <laughs> of the portability it gives right. us with our sure. electronics that sure. we have. You're in a, you're in a yeah. great spot. This is a great thing. Yeah, right. HNEI is in a great position, you know, worldwide really in terms of advancing this uh, technology. And so, doing some really good work. Yeah. Mike, you want to summarize our discussion today, as you will? Well, I mean, fuel cells, I think, hold great promise for the future. And the fact that they're doing both this, this sort of R&D work at uh, HNEI, as well as the deployment and testing of the technology, is, is really doing both ends of the spectrum here. And it's, uh, it's what's going to make it work. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks hey, for coming down. It's always nice to see you. Thank there you. will be more, I know, soon. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till I get the buses up and going. Then we can do, <laughs> we can do a show on the Big Island. <laughs> and thank you, awesome. Jean Saint Pierre, uh, and thank you, uh, Tatiana Rezinchenko, for participating in the show. And thank HNEI in general. Now, before we go, there's a certain announcement that it's important that we make. Mike. Yeah, we're coming up on the uh, Energy Policy Forum's ninth annual Clean Energy Day. Uh, it's going to be August 28th at the Lanakila Y. And this year, as we have in the past few years, we're going to be presenting transformational awards, the 2016-2017 Transformational Energy Awards uh, in um, several categories. The nom nominations deadline is June 23rd, and the uh, Energy Policy Forum will present those, those awards at the Clean Energy Day. So please uh, go on the... Uh, clean go on the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum website, and that is Hawaii Energy Policy Forum at gmail.com. And the instructions and the forms are all there. And please do submit uh, nominations for the 2016 2017 Transformational Energy Award. Thank you, Mike. Be there or be square, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be a very important event that always is every year. Thank you, Mike Hamnett. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, thanks to Jay. all our guests today, and uh, we'll see you next week with more on what HNEI. HNEI. Yeah, we're going to study this subject. You can run. We're the crown jewel. Yeah. You are. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Right.